and welcome to today's webinar, which is brought to you by the Tennessee Urban Forestry Council and the University of Tennessee School of Natural Resources. Uh, and our sole purpose of these this monthly series is simply to provide you with information and topics, speakers that can help you and the all of us really to build resilient urban forest wherever you may live and work. Uh, my name is Neil Letson. I'm your host for today, and today's webinar is titled Nutrients Trees Need and How They Get Them, featuring Dr. Jennifer Franklin, who is a professor at the University of Tennessee School of Natural Resources. Uh, I also want to introduce uh, Katie Donaldson. Many of you are familiar with her by now. For those of you that are not, she's a communication specialist at the University of Tennessee. And Katie handles all the technical and communications aspects of this webinar series. We couldn't do it without her. She uh, also pr processes, for those of y'all that are looking for CEUs through the ISA, she'll process uh, your CEU uh, this, for the certified arborist in the audience so that you don't have to worry about that just as long as you provided the information in the registration process. And she's going to talk about that a little bit later in case you have not. And by the way, uh, members of the Tennessee Urban Forestry Council, uh, if you are looking for an ISA CEU, uh, we will not charge you for that. Uh, that comes with your membership. So for the rest of you folks, uh, that may be an incentive to join the Tennessee Urban Forestry Council, and you can find more information online at their website. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Katie, and she's going to go over a few of the housekeeping details. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us. Um, I will show a slide at the end, but I don't wanna mess with the presentation right now. But if you are seeking CEUs today, would you please take a moment and rename yourself to the name you used when you registered? Um, and you can do that by going down to the participants button and finding your name and using those three dots to rename it. And I noticed that some people are having audio issues. Um, I just want to make sure that everyone can hear what I'm saying. Um, but Again, back to the CEUs, if you are seeking C, thank you, thank you, Tess. If you are seeking CEUs, please re be sure to rename yourself to the name that you use to register. Also, if you are a non-TUFC member, please pay $10 in order to receive those CEUs. We will be verifying people after this webinar to make sure that you attended the webinar in order to receive those CEUs. And, also, if you have any questions at all during this presentation, please enter them at the chat and we will answer those at the end. Neil, I think that's everything. Okay, thanks, Katie. Uh, one more thing, uh, we'd like to learn a little bit more about you and our audience. So if you would take a moment just to enter in the chat room where you're watching from, city, state, nation, whatever that may be, uh, that's not only interesting to us, but it helps us assess our audience and our outreach and and even to help select topics that may be more relevant to you. So if you'll take a few minutes to do that, we would appreciate it. So with that, uh, I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Franklin, and I want to thank her for doing this for us. This is her second time as a webinar uh, presenter, and hopefully not our last, Jennifer. But uh, in the meantime, we're looking forward to your presentation today. Well, thank you. It's good to be here. Um, and thank you for inviting me. It's I, good to be able to talk about one of my favorite subjects, uh, tree nutrition, and something that I see in urban trees quite a bit is some um, problems with tree nutrition. So I'm going to go over some basics first. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about First of all, I'm going to talk about why the tree needs nutrients and what it uses them for. Um, then a little bit about when the tree needs the nutrients, how it gets them. And 
and some of the problems or what can help or hinder its ability to get nutrients. And then we'll finish with some questions. So first of all, um, what are nutrients? So these are mineral elements that are needed for the tree to complete its life cycle. That's the definition. And they're used as components in growth. So that's really the main use is growth. Um, trees need nutrients. So these are minerals for the production of new tissues, new leaves, roots, seeds. And it uses some for maintenance as well. So um, it's not all for growth. You know, during the growing season, the tree makes some adjustments. It might make more or less chlorophyll. It might change its membranes a little bit, um, make some enzymes. So it does need some nutrients during the growing season, but generally much less than are needed for growth. So I'm gonna talk about growth first. And what we're talking about is cell division. This is at the apical meristem. And what I'm showing you is the shoot apical meristem, but we've also got meristems at the root tips. So those are the root apical meristems and the cambium for secondary growth. And the process is similar for all. So cell division requires nutrients and energy. So if you're dividing a cell, cells dividing, it has to first duplicate everything that was in that cell. That means it needs to double its DNA and all the proteins, all the, the lipids, the membranes, all the organelles, everything has to be doubled. And this is where a lot of those nutrients are used. So nitrogen is main component of DNA and of proteins. So it's needed um, quite a bit for this phase. Magnesium is needed for DNA synthesis. So it's really important as well in the early stages of cell division. And then cell division also requires energy. So the cell's getting energy from respiration. So that's the breakdown of sugars to create energy. And that uses phosphorus. So respiration needs phosphorus, ATP. P is phosphorus in the ATP. And that's the main form that uh, energy is transferred around the cell. This is done in the mitochondria. Um, we've also got Potassium, sulfur, and magnesium needed as part of that respiration process. And iron, manganese, and copper are also needed for respiration. Now you notice those are in smaller font. Um, some nutrients are needed in much lower quantities than others. And we call those the micronutrients. Some are actually needed in very, very small quantities. So iron, manganese, and copper are considered micronutrients. We just need less of them. So phosphorus deficiency is fairly common. And because the, um, the tree's not able to use energy very efficiently, it's not able to... Um, respire very well, there's excess energy, you often get this bronze color. So a phosphorus deficiency, this bronze color is very characteristic, it can look reddish or pink. And that's a little oak tree in the grass. This is the middle of July. Uh, it'd be a very pretty color if it were in, you know, October, November, but this is July. So that's not right. Um, so this is a phosphorus deficiency. Looks a little bit different in different species and depending on what other deficiencies there are at the same time. So 
So potassium is needed for protein production. Sulfur is also needed for protein production and it's a component of membranes. So those are the membranes that are holding the contents in all of the cells and all of the organelles within the cells. Then we've got boron. It's a micronutrient, stabilizes membranes, and calcium. That's a macronutrient, so it is needed in fairly large quantities. And it's important in cell signaling, but it's also important in stabilizing membranes. So if you have membranes that aren't stable, then they're kind of fluid. They don't form properly. And you end up with growth that looks really twisted. So these are a couple of, um, this, the one on the left is an oak and on the right, there's a holly. And you can see how the leaves are twisted. And it's because the membranes aren't forming properly. They don't have enough calcium uh, to stabilize them. We often see nutrient deficiency or calcium deficiency in particular here in the Southern US in late summer. Um, it's a nutrient that can't really be moved around the plant. And so it gets used up uh, and then when there's a deficiency, so towards the end of the summer, there's not very much left in the soil because the, the vegetation's taken it all up. You get right at the tip of the shoot, you get this kind of curling where there's not enough calcium for the new leaves. The potassium, so now that the cell's divided, We've got all the components doubled. Now it has to elongate. So one cell remains as a meristematic cell and the other elongates. And that just means that it gets larger. And all this really needs is water. So cell elongation is just pumping water into that cell and stretching it okay, to its mature size. That's really just water uptake. And potassium is the most important nutrient for regulating water uptake. It also regulates the opening and closing of stomata. And so if a tree is not able to take up or regulate its water uptake, um, it's not able to take up water for drying soils and it's not able to regulate its stomatal opening, then it loses a lot of water and you get a deficiency, symptoms that look very much like drought stress. So once the cell's elongated, it starts to differentiate. So this means that it becomes the kind of cell it's going to be. So it's it might be a xylem cell, it might be a mesophyll cell in the leaf, it might be a root cell, but we have all these different cell types. So it becomes specialized in whatever cell type it's going to be. And that requires hormones, you know, signaling. So what type of cell it's going to be depends on where it is, and it depends on the environment. So the cell senses what's around it, and the signals that's being given from the nearby cells and you know differentiates into the type of cell um, that's needed. So some of the nutrients that are really important in cell signaling, besides calcium that I already mentioned, are zinc and molybdenum. Um, they're also important in production of hormones, but these are also micronutrients. They're needed in very small quantities. So if you look at a developing leaf, once the cells begin to differentiate, they get chlorophyll, right? They get green. So if you look at the, the image on the right, you can see that the leaves at the very tip, the ones that are small, they're not fully developed yet, are not very green. And so as they develop and enlarge, their chlorophyll um, is 
developed as well and the chloroplasts. So we have those plastids developing into chloroplasts and all that photosynthetic machinery developing. And then you get the green leaf color. And so some of those nutrients that are very important in that chlorophyll development and in the, the structure of chlorophyll are nitrogen, sulfur, and magnesium. And then manganese and iron are micronutrients. So you can imagine if there's a deficiency in any of these particular uh, nutrients, you get a lack of green color or chlorosis on well, that sassafras. So other cells develop into xylem. So the inside of the cell is destroyed and the cell becomes an empty tube that will transport water. And in this case, those nutrients can be recycled into the other developing tissues. Okay, so looking at growth, so that's the main time that trees are using nutrients when they're growing. So when does it need it? So we can look at the growth of the tree and this is just a conceptual diagram looking at the, the relative growth rate of different parts of the tree. The shoot growth will start in the spring. And of course, this is gonna be different for different species and in different parts of the world. And I saw a couple of people from um, Edmonton or from you know, the Northern areas. Um, and it's gonna be quite a bit later there. But in the spring, you get this flush of shoot growth. Root growth usually starts before that. So you get, in our part of the world, you get root growth earlier in the spring and then later in the summer. Um, roots grow the best at the kind of the mean annual temperature in the soil. Um, so you, you get less growth in the summer where, when it's very hot, at least in our area. Um, it's also related to water availability, that, the root growth. Cambial growth starts in the spring, usually before the shoot growth, uh, and it continues right through the fall. It can continue fairly late. So then if we look at the total, um, you get a, a spike in the early spring, and then that tails off towards the fall. So that is conceptual, um, growth or growth pattern is for a neoform tree. So neoformed is when growth is continuous. So in this case, we've got one leaf developing after the other, right? So that the very tip, their cells always dividing. The little bit older cells are elongating and then cells are differentiating. So you can see on this, this image, you've got older mature leaves, you've got immature leaves uh, in various stages of development. And so in their first season of growth, when something germinates from a seed, all species do this, but then they develop into their growth pattern that's typical for their species. Um, things like birch, willow, elm, um, there are a lot of species that have this type of growth form, just continuously grow. And they'll just stop when there's not enough nutrients. So they can really take advantage of the nutrients that are available by growing. Um, but then a lack of nutrients is going to halt their growth pretty quickly, or at least slow it down quite a bit. And their growth will also just stop when the temperatures become too cold or other environmental signals like um, photo period. We have a different type of growth, a different um, pattern of growth. It's called preformed growth. And you can see the large buds on the end of this oak tree, or oak branch. 
and sometimes called determinant growth. So in this case, cell division isn't necessarily followed by cell elongation. You get a lot of cell division happening, but the cells don't elongate right away. They stay really small inside of that bud. And so when you see a tree that appears to be doing nothing, uh, that has a preformed growth pattern, it's actually doing a lot of cell division. It's just really not uh, very visible, but it's forming those buds. So remember when it's doing cell division, it needs nutrients. So you might not see these trees growing, but they are taking up nutrients quite a bit. Um, and then elongation is separate and the cells elongate kind of suddenly and you get this really fast growth. So things like pine, oak, and hickory have a preformed growth type. So in this case, the amount of nutrients that are available will help determine whether that tree flushes a second time during that year, or it might determine the number of leaves that are produced the following year. So the nutrients that it takes up at the end of one year are used or are already incorporated into those little leaves that expand the next season. So if we're to look at a tree with a preformed growth type, here you see that shoot growth occurring just very rapidly in the spring. But thinking about cell division, the cells are actually dividing. Those meristems are very active in the fall when it's creating that bud. So you've still got the, the same patterns of growth in the roots and in the cambium, but the shoot growth, um, they need quite a few nutrients later in the year. And that's often when they're available from the litter fall. So some species have multiple flushes of growth. Uh, there are some that will only have one flush, some have two or more, and that's partly determined by genetics and partly by the environment and whether there are nutrients available to it. So if there aren't enough nutrients, there's no cell division, and you just don't get that second flush growth. So here you might get a little bit more of a kind of a plateau of cell division and nutrient demand early in the growing season, and then another spike later in the growing season. So these are really using uh, nutrients at different times of the year. And I should also mention that fruit and seed production, it can use a lot of nutrients. I didn't put that in here. Um, production of flowers, fruits, and seeds is very species specific. A lot of species are producing fruit towards the end of the year, uh, and there's a high demand for nutrients at that point as well. So that would kind of even out uh, that need for nutrients across the summer. Okay, so how does the tree get the nutrients? Well, I'll think about the root system first. And so the roots, water is going in through the roots and the, brings the solutes with it. Now, both water and solutes enter through the cell membrane. Solutes are mineral nutrients. Some of those can enter passively, but very often they're entering the cell against their concentration gradient. So that requires energy to actually pump those nutrients into the cell. So that's called active transport. So there are these 
um, proteins that are in the membrane that will pump um, nutrients through that membrane. So here's a fine root. Most nutrients enter the roots through those fine roots. Um, they're the most active. So if you look at the nutrient uptake activity of roots, the fine roots, the, the white ones that don't have subarin are the most active. Although there's a larger volume of um, older roots and so they can also take up quite a few nutrients. But if you look at the, the young root, the water and solutes, the nutrients can move through the cell walls, or they can move right into the cells and that um, through from one cell to the next. Okay. If they're going through the cell walls, now the xylem is not alive, it's just empty, right? So the tree needs some way to keep those ions from getting into the xylem. So it, it meets that endodermis, that's the, has a Casparian strip, so that's a, a really waxy strip, and it prevents ions or nutrients from moving through the cell walls. So that way it forces everything through a membrane. That means that the tree has some regulation over what it's taking up and what it isn't because it has to go through a membrane. So here you can see that endodermis, that's the, it shows up as green in that slide. Um, this particular root has a second layer on exodermis. That's a, uh, also prevents movement of water and ions. So that forces everything to go through the membranes and just allows the tree to regulate what's taken up and what's not. So that means that as long as the root's intact, great. The tree is um, taking up what it needs and not taking up what it doesn't need um, for the most part. But if a root gets injured, that means the tree no longer has control over what's going in. So if you look at the kind of the permeability of roots, most of the roots actually have this layer of subarin, so they have a pretty low permeability. So if you cut a root, now you can see the xylem, right? You can look right in. And that means that everything that's in the soil solution can just flow into that xylem. And the tree is no longer regulating what it takes up. So if a tree is injured, if a root system's injured, it can, um, really have detrimental effects on the tree nutrition by letting in things that it doesn't need um, and not being able to take up what it does need. Now this will heal up pretty quickly. The larger the root, the longer it takes to heal, but um, fine roots will, will heal up within a few days and get that uh, ability to, to regulate back. So usually if there's injury to the root system, it's best to avoid fertilizing for several days or several weeks until that um, has time to heal. Okay, so that's how the root actually takes up nutrients, but there's a lot more to it, a lot of things that can help. So roots will make exudates. So these are different compounds that are exuded, pushed out of the root. Um, some of them 
can chelate or uh, grab those nutrient particles and help bring them into the roots. There are some that actually will change the form of a, um, the nutrients in the soil. There are some exudates that can change phosphorus. Phosphorus is one that's pretty important and it's often limiting to plant growth, to tree growth. So they can solubilize phosphorus. Root exudates do a lot of other things, particularly interact with the microorganisms in the soil. So pretty important and an area of recent study. We've got mycorrhizal fungi. I'm sure everybody's well aware of mycorrhizae. They're mutualists. They extend that surface area of the root system. The tree gives them carbohydrates and in return, mycorrhizae scavenge the soil for nutrients and transfer those into the root system. We have two distinct types. There's the arbuscular mycorrhizae, often called, sometimes called endomycorrhizae, and the ectomycorrhizae. And they're generally associated with different species of trees. There are some trees that will have both, uh, but most are primarily either arbuscular or ectomycorrhizal. Those are very important for tree nutrition. But there are some differences between them. Um, the arbuscular mycorrhizae don't actually solubilize phosphorus, but they're very important in phosphorus limiting environments. And it was recently found that it's their association with the phosph phosphate solubilizing bacteria that secretes organic acids that allows it to take up more phosphorus. So kind of interesting. So all of these interactions between the soil communities, the bacteria, um, mycorrhizae, and root systems are really important. The arbuscular mycorrhizae are generally better at taking up inorganic forms of nutrients. Um, the ectomycorrhizae are often found in systems where they're uh, really associated with decomposition. So a lot of forested systems. Uh, and you see mushrooms, right? Those are the fruiting bodies of the ectomycorrhizae. So these different you know, species of trees that are associated with these different types of mycorrhizae really have different responses to fertilizer application. And they found that those arbuscular mycorrhizae associated trees responded positively to you know, inorganic fertilizer, but the ectomycorrhizal trees didn't. They actually had a negative growth response. We've also got rhizobium. Not as common on tree species, but these are a, ba a bacteria that form root nodules, mainly on legumes. Here, that's a, we have black locust. We have several leguminous trees, and you can see some of those little balls on that root system of a black locust. So those help to fix nitrogen. There are also some free-living nitrogen-fixing bacteria in the soil. So moving away from the soil and from the root system, we know that the foliage can take up nutrients as well. And a recent study found that nutrient uptake, nitrogen uptake by the foliage might be as important as uptake from the roots. Um, they've also found nutrient uptake of phosphorus um, from dust and Foliar sprays are sometimes used for nutrients, um, particularly micronutrients. You can improve 
the foliar nutrient status. Then we've got remobilization. So not all nutrients are coming from outside. Um, a lot of the, the nutrients are just cycled within the tree. So nitrogen in particular, there's a lot of storage and move, you know, movement around that stem. So depending on the species, they've found that, um, it, you know, it differs a lot for different species, but up to about 85% of the nitrogen for that new growth can come from stored pools of nitrogen. In deciduous trees, those pools are usually stored in the roots and in the wood. So in the stem, um, in evergreens, they're stored in the leaves, so the older foliage. And rubisco is one of those main proteins that's part of that photosynthetic pathway. And there's a really good review on that. So some of those high mobility nutrients, so those are those nutrients that are really easily moved around, those are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So if you have a, a deficiency on any of those, um, it generally shows up across the whole tree at the same time, because if one part of the tree is deficient, it'll just pull it from somewhere else, right? So you get this kind of overall general yellowing but you also get very rapid cycling of these. If they become available, they're taken up very quickly because the tree can just store it for when, for when it needs it. It stores it over the winter. So they're cycled very rapidly. Uh, the low mobility nutrients like calcium that I mentioned earlier have a much slower cycling. Um, and you get that deficiency symptoms showing up in those young leaves first. You can also get those nutrients being remobilized to developing fruit and seeds. And here you've got a holly that's got a really heavy seed crop developing on it. And you can see how chlorotic the leaves are uh, right around those fruit. It's because the fruit are, and seeds are pulling nutrients from the closest available area. And those are those surrounding leaves. Um, so they found that if there's a heavy seed crop, it can deplete the tree of nutrients, particularly nitrogen, for several years. Okay, so why do we have problems with nutrient uptake? Often it's just poor root development or root injury. Um, sometimes it's the time of year. If you look at the image in the center, you see nice green leaves towards the back. The, so the ones that were developed earlier in the year. But as growth continues, this is in August, it runs out of nutrients and you get leaves that are chlorotic. Um, they're low in some of those immobile nutrients. And then growth just stops. pH is often thought of as, as a reason for nutrient deficiency. And certainly pH does affect the nutrients that are available in the soil. Um, but we've done some studies with pH if you do it in a controlled environment, it absolutely affects the growth of the trees. But in a natural environment, looking at urban soils, we've really not found a strong relationship because there are just too many other factors. But we do see areas that have a high pH. There's generally low phosphorus availability, and you see a lot of phosphorus deficiency in those soils. That's what you see on the right. The image on the right, 
there's several problems going on. You can see the, the bronzing color, that's a phosphorus deficiency. You can see the curling of the leaves, that's a calcium deficiency. So this poor little oak seedling is deficient in many different things, many nutrients. Um, and part of that is the soil that it's on. This is in a mine soil that's in a fairly, fairly high pH, but it's also surrounded by some really dense competition. And we know that competition with surrounding vegetation can um, reduce the availability of nutrients for trees. Um, there's been some, some look at those different root systems of uh, comparing trees that are healthy versus the unhealthy. And the takeaway from this study was really that it's the root system. If you've got a good, strong root system that's got all of its associated biota, right? So it has to have the biological components like the bacterial communities, the fungal communities, and the invertebrate communities. Altogether, that makes for a healthy tree. Lots of nutrient uptake. And we know that different trees do well in different soil pH. And so some species are very particular about the pH. They'll only tolerate a pretty narrow range. Other use a much wider range. Um, and you'll see a nutrient deficiency outside of those preferred ranges or optimal ranges for those species. So for competition, done some studies on competition as cover of that herbaceous vegetation gets to about 60%. Above that, it has a negative impact on the trees, um, on tree growth. And at lower covers, sometimes it has a positive impact and sometimes it has a negative impact. So there's just generally no clear relationship. So looking at how the species of those ground covers influence the trees. Looking at the, the chlorophyll content. So on the top right, this is the chlorophyll content of oak roots when they're grown in different um, types of ground covers. And you can see if there's no ground cover, they're just in bare soil, they've got lots of chlorophyll, the worst one was the perennial ryegrass, and that's the, the lawn grass, right? So it really has a negative impact, um, huge impact on the ability or the nutrient uptake of those trees. It also has a big impact on their water use and water availability. So we also know that all of those soil properties influence the mycorrhizae. And we've got, this is a study looking at different mycorrhizae and different sites. It's really associated with um, you know, soil pH, with soil nutrients. So different soil chemistry, you get different mycorrhizal associations and different influences on tree growth. Um, this is looking at the effect of mycorrhizal communities on the growth of American chestnut. And so tree selection really needs to be based on the soils. pH isn't necessarily a limiting factor, but if you choose tree species that are matched to the pH of the soil, uh, they do much better, I and mean, you have much less nutrient deficiency. Trying to correct a nutrient deficiency in the soil can be tricky because when you add fertilizer, you're also changing the ratio of different nutrients in the soil, um, and that is can inhibit uptake in some cases. Also, mulching 
alters the uh, the amount of carbon to nitrogen in the soil. So that carbon to nitrogen ratio is really important. If you add a lot of mulch to try to control some of this herbaceous vegetation around it, um, you increase the carbon to nitrogen ratio, and then you get this explosion of bacterial growth. So those microorganisms below ground will grow and they take up the nitrogen. And sometimes you can get a nitrogen deficiency uh, from those mulch additions as well. Uh, so matching species to that soil chemistry is very helpful in avoiding nutrient deficiency. And with that, I will be happy to take any questions. All right, thank you so much, Professor Franklin. Um, I do have a few questions for you and anyone else, please enter them in the chat if you think of any. Um, how does current how does current increase in carbon dioxide affect tree growth and the availability of other nutrients? Oh, that's a great question. There was a study done um, just down the road here at Oak Ridge National Lab. I'm looking at that and the increase in carbon dioxide increased the growth rate for a while. But because the trees were growing faster, they were taking up nutrients more quickly and growth then slowed down after, I don't remember the time frame, but it was um, maybe 10 years. The growth did eventually slow down and return to its base level because it was nutrient limited. Yeah. Um, next question, what do you recommend for the timing of applying nutrients to benefit a tree? So that depends so much on the species. You know, some species will really benefit from a nutrient application in the fall. So if you look at a, a neoform species, they're using most of their nutrients early in the year. So spring is really good right? Spring and summer. If you've got a preformed species, in the fall, they're forming those new buds and in the late summer. Um, so if you apply nutrients at that time, particularly phosphorus, it's really good for root growth. You don't want to apply a lot of nitrogen in the fall because it might prevent it from going dormant on time. Um, so it's it does depend a lot on the tree species. Uh, it depends on the, the demands from fruit development as well. So there's no easy answer for that, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, next question. How effective is mycorrhizae in manufactured or retail soil? I'm sorry, you, your audio cut out there for a second. Oh, I mine did. How effective is mycorrhizae, and forgive me if I'm butchering that word, in manufactured or retail soil? Oh, okay. That's, yeah, that's a great question. So often you see soil with, myc with added mycorrhizae. It's advertised. Um. Mycorrhizae are really pretty specific for the species that they colonize. And so there's some that are more generalist and that's what they'll tend to add um, to those soils, those commercial soils, because they don't know what species you're gonna grow. So they, they might help um, depending on the species they could hurt. Some mycorrhizae could be beneficial to the, you know, the grass and not the tree. So generally, I, th I think it's better to try to find the mycorrhizae that 
are associated with the tree that you're trying to grow. And buying them in a commercial mix, um, you can, but you can just go out and find a tree that's growing really well and is really healthy. And you take a little scoop of soil and bring that back and just scatter it around your tree. And that just does wonders because then you've got not just the mycorrhizae, but all the other associated bacteria with it. Um, is, I'd say that's generally more effective than buying the commercial stuff, if you can. Commercial, you know, mycorrhizal application usually doesn't hurt and it can help. Okay, uh, before I get to the other questions, um, if anyone does need to log off, uh, go ahead and log off. If you are seeking CEUs, just make sure before you log off that your username is what it was for your registration, or you can enter your name and your ISA CEU certification number in the chat. Um, Professor Franklin, do you have a moment to answer a few more questions? Oh, sure. Yep, lots of time. Okay, great. Um, the next one, what pH do oak trees favor? Okay, uh, most of our oaks here in the southeast favor about a 3.5 to 5.5. Um, if you're going to plant in a more alkaline soil, chinkapin, chinkapin oak is really the only one that does very well in a more neutral soil that I found anyway. Let's see. Um, how long does it take for trees? How long does it take for trees? I think this is supposed to be how long does it take for trees to get nutrients from root to leaves and then to fruit? Mm. Um, it can be several days. So if it's going all the way from the root up to the leaf, it, it can be several days. And there are studies on how much it moves and how quickly nutrients move. It depends whether they're moving from an internal compartment in the tree. So if they're just being relocated, you know, within the tree, they can move pretty quickly. If they're take, being taken up from the root and moving up to the shoot, it can take a little longer, but it's usually not longer than several days. And this person, I think they're asking for the best timeline on um, when carnivores best take up through June 15th, or I'm trying to figure out the best way to word this because of how they sent it in the chat. Um, they give the dates June 15th through July 15th, and they're wondering when is the best time frame for carnivores. So conifers or evergreens in general, um, most of their nutrients, or at least almost all of their nitrogen comes from their older foliage, not from what's applied. So even when you apply nitrogen, they're not using that for the new growth. They're taking nitrogen that was in the older leaves and just moving it into the new growth, maybe because it's closer. So they're, most of them are preformed species. Um, so nutrients other than nitrogen, they would be using a lot of more in the fall because they're forming what's going to be next year's new growth. Right? So nitrogen, it needs fairly early because it needs it to green up. But things like calcium, phosphorus, a lot of the other nutrients, it needs more in the fall. Um, as it's forming the, the next year's growth. Do you have any experience using biochar for trees? I haven't. No, it'd be interesting. Okay. 
And let me see. How often do you recommend reapplication of mycorrhizae into a manufactured, compacted, or previously degraded soil environment? <laughs> um, a lot of mycorrhizae, mycorrhizae move very well on their own. Um, my ectomycorrhizae. The arbuscular don't move as well on their own. So those those species that use the arbuscular mycorrhizae will benefit more from the application uh, because so they're generally not just arriving. The ectos, you know, they even turn over from one month to the next. Uh, so the tree can kind of choose to some extent, it chooses which mycorrhizae it's going to use too, because it puts out root exudates that attract different mycorrhizal species. Um, so applying mycorrhizae, say it can help, especially if you're in a really poor soil. I'd usually just do it at the beginning in the establishment phase, because after that, whatever is there is there or has arrived. You know, if it doesn't take, what you apply doesn't take, it's because maybe the chemistry's wrong. Um, mycorrhizae are really fussy about their soil chemistry. You change it a little bit and it, they'll all change from one mycorrhizal you know, community to another. Um, so you could try a different, you know, if it doesn't take the first time, you probably wanna try a different mix second time so you could just but once something is there and it's got its community of mycorrhizae you don't have to reapply and just a few more here is there a common nutrient deficiency that you see in oak trees in central and west tennessee if so is there a specific time of year it occurs I'm sorry, I didn't get that. Um, it, is there a common nutrient deficiency that you see in oak trees in central and west Tennessee? If mm. so, is there a specific time of year that this occurs? I am not that familiar with west Tennessee trees. Um, I do see you know, calcium deficiency and just general nutrient deficiency at the end of the year. Uh, I know that what's often called iron chlorosis is probably the most common type of deficiency, general nutrient deficiency. And it's not necessarily iron, it's a mixture of things. Um, it's the green color of the foliage is often returned by injecting iron into the stem. It doesn't cure the problem, um, but it, it can help. So that's it. iron chlorosis or iron, yeah, iron chlorosis so is a, a whole bunch of different nutrients that are deficient. And that's probably a really common one, particularly in West Tennessee. Um, is there anything that can be done to help with newly planted trees along arterial roads to get them through a winter with heavy salt use for road conditions without having to increase the nitro nitrogen in the fall? I only got part of that. I've got a low bandwidth notice here. <laughs> Could you repeat? Uh, yes. Is there anything that can be done to help with newly planted trees along arterial roads to get them through a winter with heavy salt use for road conditions without having to increase the nitrogen in the fall? Okay, yeah. So salt is an issue that we don't have so much problem with in Tennessee, or at least here, um, but a lot of the country does. So the issue with salt is that the ions in the salt compete with the nutrients for uptake. 
Uh, and so you end up with a tree that's deficient in some of those other nutrients, like magnesium in particular. The, the chlorides leach out pretty quickly. Um, varying the salt type, if it's possible, you know, if you can work with the city to apply salts that are less damaging to trees, that can have a huge effect. You know, you don't get that negative impact that you do from like sodium chloride. Um, other than planting salt tolerant trees, that's, you know, the best, the best way to do it. If you can find trees that are going to tolerate that, um, that's your, really your best approach, I think. And last question, is there a book or a publication containing most of this information for future reference? Hmm. Well, I've, I've got, I use the physiology of woody plants, but it's, it's got a, a lot of other things as well. So this was kind of put together from years of teaching my class in tree biology um, and then some of the new literature. So I don't have a good single source for it, unfortunately. Um, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> and for those who are wondering, I am going to post this recording on the School of Natural Resources YouTube page. We have a playlist that's specifically for right. Tennessee Urban Forestry Council webinars. Right, and it did put a lot of the references in there, particularly the newer ones, you know, the new studies. So there are some really great references in those. And those are all the questions I have. Okay, uh, Katie, thanks. Uh, while we've got Dr. Franklin, I, I was gonna ask one quick question. Uh, yeah. I was capturing so, a lot of your points. You had so many of them there. I'm not sure I got it correctly, but you had a point or a slide that said that herbaceous growth uh, in competition that exceeded 60% of the ground cover, I'm assuming, that's when you begin to have a negative impact on a tree's capacity to right. access nutrients. That's what we found. Does that mean that I'm trying to put kill two birds with one stone here? Uh, we have uh, initiatives to remove invasive species from our forest, both urban and rural, bush honeysuckle, the privet, the all kinds of things which completely have compromise the lower canopy and the ground cover if we are is that another benefit of attacking the invasives uh successfully that it would release more nutrients to the remaining trees did i say that correctly yeah i, I get your point and that's a, a really good question um i think a lot of those effects of invasive species, there's nutrient competition. You know, there is always nutrient competition. But there's also a lot going on with those microbial communities. And that's one of the things I've been looking at is how you know invasive species interact below ground with our native species, with our trees. Um, and it's through those mycorrhizal associations and bacterial associations, it's pretty complex. And so it's difficult to predict. Okay. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. Uh, okay. Well, thank you again, Dr. Franklin. And, um, we know we're going to get you back in the future, but, uh, you think about your next topic, because this is, this has been a, a a home run and we just all the information that you provided so practical uh, and useful i really am grateful for that and i am gonna uh katie i do want to look at this again or maybe uh dr franklin your slides your slide program can did you say you would make that available uh where folks absolutely 
Okay, that might be the easiest way. Uh, but there's a lot of good information there. Thank you so much. You're very okay. welcome. Help, happy to do it. Great. Katie, uh, we have a speaker next month. Do you have a slide? We can kind of give folks a preview on that. Yes, let me pull it up here. Make sure okay. y'all can see that. Appreciate uh, the, all of you that are still online, all 52 of you. Um, and just want to give you a heads up on next month. Uh, what is What date is that? April 18th, Thursday, mm -hmm. same time. Uh, we're going to have Samantha Brewer, uh, who is a volunteer engagement coordinator for the USA National Phenology Network, uh, going to talk about observing seasonal changes in plants and animals. And uh, just a little background, uh, the UA USA National Phenology Network is, for the last 10 or so years, has coordinated thousands of trained volunteers across the country to look at changes uh, in uh, tree and animal or plant and animal species uh, to try to find out how climate change is impacting, uh, well, in our case, when leaves come out, flowers, and how long they stay on in the uh, throughout the year, but what impact is having to the annual changes, physical changes in plants and animals. And just uh, one of the things that really caught my attention was that from this research, it came out earlier this year, Nashville's spring started, I believe, 10 days earlier than the average from 1991 to 2021. So we're seeing the impact here in Tennessee of, of uh, plant species um, emerging in the spring earlier. And this has implications for other uh, ho is a host species their interaction with other species and the impact on our food web. Anyway, she'll go into a lot more detail than I'm giving you, but I encourage you to, to uh, take time out and register for this uh, webinar. It should be a, a good one. All right. Anything else, Katie? I think that is it for now. Okay. Well, thanks again, folks, for joining us, and we'll see you next month.